daily i'm your host rebecca aka crafting journey that's how i'm known on facebook if you want to join the facebook group you just have to answer a couple of questions it's crafting journey is the name of the group and we'll let you in and you can show off your works in progress i just finished this one right here this legend of zelda finished that last friday yeah or saturday I don't remember. Anyway, we're going to do part three of the state of Michigan versus Beverly McCollum. Now, as you recall, Beverly, Mc Beverly McCollum is on trial for second degree murder for plotting, which is intentional. But why not first degree murder? Because she was hiding out in Italy, living in Italy with her Pakistani husband, husband number five or six. And they had to extradite her back to the United States. And there was an agreement between Italy and the U.S. that she, they would only return her if she not be tried for first degree murder. So second degree murder has a penalty of up to 15 years in prison. So that's the max that this woman is looking at, which is unfortunate. So in this part today, I'm going to recap her live testimony. She decided... Um, not so wisely, to take the stand. Yes, and I'm sure it was against her attorney's advice because this woman had a lot to say. She could not shut her mouth. She, oh, man. So let me kind of set the stage for you. She's, um, I don't know how old she is. Honestly, I don't know. Her oldest daughter, Deneen, well, I mean, let me, I don't know. I don't know how old she is. She's got one, two, three, four children, three girls and a boy. Um, Deneen is in prison. She got a life sentence for first degree murder relating to the murder of Robert uh, Carballo. Carballo. So Robert Carballo uh, was murdered in the basement of the home that they were all living in in this small town called Charlotte, Michigan. So she, she takes the stand in her own defense and she's coming, she's clearly very rehearsed with her attorney, which, I mean, that's good. So she knows that she needs to look at the jury when she's testifying. So she's got that down. She knows just to answer the question, but it all falls apart. She holds up very well on direct examination. She goes a, a little far afield a couple of times, but it really breaks down on, <laughs> on cross-examination. Oh my God. She, uh, she just could not shut her mouth and it did not go well for her. So she starts out by saying, no, she was never married to Robert, um, that they met. She met Robert in 1988 and uh, Cicely was born in 1993. So she met him in Texas now. So that means they were married for a period of time. She says, well, she said they weren't married. So they were together for a period of time and he goes to jail at some point. We don't know when he went to jail or what he went to jail for. I'd love to know that. But he doesn't get out of jail until 2002. And so he has himself transferred to a couple of different places. He first, he gets himself transferred to Louisiana prison. So she moves to Louisiana because she says, I wanted to support him. You know, I wanted him to know his children. Um, she says, I even flew his mother in from the DR. She calls it the DR, you know, Dominican Republic, which is where he was from. I flew her in for a month so she could you know, keep her relationship with her son. Apparently he was very, very close to his mother. So they, she eventually moves to Charlotte because he gets himself transferred to Connecticut because they had their parole rules were different and he liked them and not the ones in Louisiana. I got, I, don't, I didn't know you had all this freedom while you were in prison to just choose where you want to go, but he ends up in Connecticut. She moves to Charlotte. When he gets out, they all move in together. And they're one big happy family. Deneen is living there. 
she, at the beginning of that every year, 2002, she moves in her boyfriend. Now, this is Chris McMillan. Now, Chris testified that I was not her boyfriend. We were really good friends. Deneen was gay. And the closest he ever got was she stripped out of her clothes one day and was dancing around on the bed. He never slept with her. But according to Beverly, she believed that Chris was Deneen's boyfriend. So when they were living there, she also had her other two or younger children, Cicely, who was nine, and Tasha, who was 11. She had not had her baby boy yet. So at this point in time, she's got the three girls, three different fathers. Cicely was Robert Carvalho's daughter. And like I said, she was born in 1993. So that would make her seven, yeah, nine years old at the time of this uh incident so she was asked about whether she argues with robert because chris mcmillan's testimony is that they were they got into these horrendous arguments and her mascara would be running and she would be crying and she said yeah of course we argued but you know nothing nothing violent or, or no, i was never crying all the time and no i didn't have mascara running down my face so this is kind of the theme of her testimony everybody's lying. Chris is lying. Deneen is lying. Cicely's lying. Everybody's lying. Nobody's telling the truth. And if they're not telling the truth, it's because you didn't ask them. Okay. So she says, Robert did not like Chris, but nevertheless, he was there. So Robert at the time of the murders was working as a newspaper delivery men. So she said he would be throwing papers all night. He would come home in the morning, take the girls to school. This was their typical routine. He would take the girls, Tasha and Cicely, to school, come back home, and then she and he would go to bed and get affectionate and then sleep for a little while. She would sleep till, say, about 11 o'clock or so. He would not get up till one or two, and she would go on about her day. She did not work because she was had a workers' compensation claim pending then, something about her arm. So she did admit that she, at the time, was a an, an alcoholic, an active alcoholic. Yeah. And she mentioned the drink she drank. Uh, I don't recall what it is. I'm not, I don't drink, so I, I, it wasn't familiar to me. So... Here's the thing that stands out to me about her testimony. She can recall these incredible details. I don't have this kind of memory. I don't, my sister does. I just don't. Like my sister knows what street we lived on when she was 10. Like, how is that even possible? So this woman, like same thing. She remembers what time the kids bathed in 2002. That was 22 years ago. I can't tell you what time I bathed in 2002, 22 years ago. Was it nighttime? Was it daytime? I don't know, but she has like this incredible memory of this particular event that day. And we're going to get to that. Yeah. So <laughs> I would like to tell you though, just a little bit about her because I haven't shown her, but she, I'll show you a still of her. I was, I was going to pull some of her testimony, but it's, she's all over the place. She's a hot mess, a hot mess. She looks like she'd been rode hard and put away wet. Anyway, she she is wheeled up to the to the witness stand, and then she needs a walker to get herself to onto the witness stand. So clearly obese, and I, I mean I'm not calling the kettle black here, but she, I'm just describing her. Her hair is like a mess, like. She went through a wind tunnel to get in here. She's wearing this purple scarf that she's been wearing the entire trial. I don't know if they gave her that at the jail or I have no idea. So, and she, when she's asked a question, she has this like weird way of answering. Like the dialect is, you can hear some Italian in the dialect. And she's actually asked about that on cross examination. You know, why are you, do you, why are you using this Italian dialect? I don't use a dialect. I speak five languages. Okay, well, 
And then when she when she at, when she's asked a question, she'll start to answer it, and then she'll fade out. It really was just her, start like that, and they'll have to say, "We didn't hear what you said," because she's mumbling. And some of it I could make out, so I, I could not. And then she would be asked to repeat what she just mumbled. So she has a lot of denials, but here's what she says happened on May 7th. And she remembers all this. So their routine was he would, Robert would bring the kids to school. Like I said, they do all that. And then later on, their routine would be every day. Uh, he, somebody would pick the girls up from school. He didn't, Robert didn't like the girls, Tasha and Cicely taking the bus. So he would normally, most of the time he would pick them up like three, three thirty, And then she would make dinner. Beverly McCollum would make dinner while the girls did their homework. He would be, Robert would be down in the basement pretty much from the time he woke up till he just spent most of his time down in the basement. She says, I never went down in that basement. I don't go to the basement. And on cross-examination, one of the things she kind of slid in there was like, um, that Robert didn't like women in the basement. This was like his place. And the only woman he liked in the who that in the basement was Deneen, her oldest daughter. So he, she said that Robert liked to go down there and smoke his pot. He wouldn't allow smoking anywhere else in the house, but he would go downstairs and he would smoke pot. And he was also drinking at the time. So on May 7th, and she said she would serve dinner every night, 4.30. Then the girls would get a shower at, you know, after, after dinner. They'd get a shower. They'd uh, wind down in bed and then get up the next morning, shower again. <laughs> These kids had a lot of showers. So on May 7th, she gets up around 11 as her usual routine. And Deneen comes home and... Now, actually, here's what she said happened. Robert, when Robert gets up, he tells her that when he, after he dropped the girls off at school, he went to get gas in his van and he was approached by someone, she doesn't know who it was, who told him something. Now, because of the hearsay rule, we don't know what it was he was told, but let me tell you, I know what it was. Uh, we figure it out, obviously. Obviously, someone came up to him and said, hey, you know, your daughter's gay. And she likes women and she's not really with Chris. So we don't know who that was. He comes home. He is pissed off. He's like, he's going to have a come to Jesus with uh, Deneen. And she's going to be, you know, things are going to be different around the house. And she's going to be leaving, moving out that day. And Chris is going as well. So he goes down to the basement. She calls Deneen. Deneen comes home from wherever she is. She said Deneen at the time worked at a car dealership and uh, selling cars until she <laughs> lost her driver's license from two D DWIs. Um, so I don't know if she was actually working at the time or around the time. I don't know. So she calls her. Deneen comes home and she tells Deneen, you need to talk to Robert. And according to Beverly, this was the first time she learned that her daughter was gay. Up until this time, she's thinking, uh, no, she, Chris is her boyfriend. This is what she's saying. She denied that she did any drugs. I, no, I was an alcoholic. I didn't do cocaine. I didn't do marijuana. I didn't do any of that. Okay. So... She informs Deneen later that afternoon, Robert goes to pick up the girls, comes home with the girls. The girls are sitting doing their homework and Deneen goes down to the basement with Chris down to talk to Robert. So at 4.30 when dinner's done, Beverly goes down to the basement, but she says she only goes down to four or five steps. That's all. So she goes down her four or five steps and she says, dinner's ready. And he says, no, we're in the middle of a conversation. Go ahead and eat. You know, we need to finish talking. Okay. 
So she goes back up. She sits down with her girls, Tasha and, and Cicely, and they finish their dinner. Uh, about an hour passes, maybe 5.30-ish. She goes back to the basement, goes down the stairs again and says, are y'all going to eat? And he's like, no, we're still talking. She goes back upstairs. She tells the girls to, you know, get ready for bed. It's only 5.30, but <laughs> get ready for bed. And she is putting away all the food. She goes back to the basement a third time. Only four or five steps. She never goes in. This time when she goes to the basement, someone grabs her ankle. Now, when they grab her ankle, she, uh, she, there's nothing on the side of the stairs. She says there's no banister. There's just these stairs. So she's, you know, she's losing her balance and she's grabbing for things and she grabs something and she, when she grabs it, it's loose and it swings backward and it hits Robert in the face. Now she didn't know that that was Robert until she heard him cry out. Um, but she said it wasn't, it was very superficial wound on his face. It was, you know, nothing a bandaid wouldn't, you know, was not life threatening. And so she goes back upstairs and later on, Deneen comes out you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock, Deneen comes up the stairs and she's all upset and she's, you know, she says they killed Robert. And she said she couldn't breathe. She's like hyperventilating. She's, and Deneen's panicking, saying, give me something, give me something. So she hands her a, a trash bag. <laughs> and Deneen says, what am I going to do with this trash bag? And she throws it back at her mom. So Deneen and Robert, so me, my mom, mom, she said, she said, mom, can you walk out to the pole barn with me? Now, I don't know what a pole barn is, but they walk out to a pole barn and she leaves Deneen there. Chris is there. She goes back in the house. She says, I went into the bathroom and I'm crying. Why didn't you call 911? It didn't occur to her. It didn't occur to her. Yeah. She said she didn't know what to think. Didn't know what, she didn't know what to think. It's like she panicked, I guess. I, I don't know. In any case, Deneen comes back in the house and says, I need a ride. And she's like, I'm not giving you a ride anywhere. Uh, you know, by then she's in her bedroom. So Deneen's in her, coming into her room, asking for a ride. And she's like, no, I'm not giving you a ride. She goes, well, the girls are already in the car. She's like, the girls are, what do you mean the girls are already in the car? Chris had taken Tasha and Cicely, who had been asleep, woke them up, put them in the vehicle. And now she didn't want her girls to be alone with Chris and Deneen because she was now scared of them. She did not know that Robert's body was in the van. So she's, they're asking her to drive somewhere because she's the only one with a valid driver's license. So she doesn't know where she's going, but Deneen is directing her around. But before she starts directing her around, she drives three different places. And the three places are family members. And she, she says that she was going to ask these family members if they could watch Cicely and and the other child, Tasha. And two of them weren't home. And the, the first one was, uh, he had something he had to go do, go to a game or something. So finally, at the third stop, when no one was home, Deneen says to her mom, mom, cut the bull crap. I got Robert's body in the trunk here and we cannot stay in Charlotte. So <laughs> how that hearsay came in, I don't know, but it did. The defense was not doing a lot of objecting uh, on cross-examination. So a lot of stuff came in that probably shouldn't have. The prosecution on cross-examination was testifying. Like he was just making statements, not answer, not asking questions. He was just making statements. And nobody was stopping him. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, please object. Nope. No, they weren't objecting. It was very, very weird. So she, once she, Deneen tells her to cut the bull crap, she directs her mom to the highway. 
Now she's driving on the highway. And once she gets on the highway, Chris starts directing her. And she said they drove for a good long while. And finally, Chris tells her to pull over. She pulls over and they're at this gate. And Chris and Deneen get out of the van, take go around, open the back of the van, take something out. And she said she could, it was way too dark. She couldn't see what they were doing, but she could hear that they had went off towards the right. And then the next thing she knows, uh, Chris, now meanwhile, Tasha and Cicely are sleeping in the van, which is very consistent with what Cicely testified to. So next thing she knows, she sees she uh, sees Chris running towards the van going, go, 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 start, start, the, start the car, start the car. And he jumps in, jumps over Sicily to get to the back of the van because it was a multi, one of those multi-seat vans. There was, you know, the front seat, the front and passenger seat. Then there was passenger seats and more passenger seats. So he jumped over Sicily to get to the back of the passenger, the back passenger seat. And he wakes up the girls at this point. Then there's this huge explosion. She said it just rocked the earth. She hears this explosion. She sees Janine running. Janine, she starts going because Chris is telling her, go, go, go. She starts driving and Janine jumps in the van. So she tells the girls to calm down, go back to sleep. So she said that when they were on their way returning to Charlotte, she asked them, what, what did you guys do? And uh, they, she was never, because of hearsay, she wasn't able to say what they said. But I was curious what they told her they did. <laughs> she denies any involvement. She said, yes, he owned two rings and a cross. Because the testimony by Chris is that she wanted the gold ring that he had. And she actually went to the body, got the gold ring, and then poured gasoline on him. And she vehemently denied ever being near Robert's body. Then she talked. They, then they talked about the trunk. Um, in fact, going back to jewelry, she said she'd never seen the jewelry since he went missing. She's never seen it, or since he was killed by Deneen and and Chris. According to her, she never saw the jewelry again. So she gets back home. She puts the girls to bed. She goes to bed. She says, I couldn't sleep. But the next morning, she takes them to school. Never thinks about calling the police. She comes home and she calls her mother and she calls her sister to tell them what happened. And she wasn't allowed to say what they told her, but it does come out eventually because she, she, like I said, she you couldn't shut this woman up. That she, that these were two people that she told what actually happened and when, and their response was you need to get as far away from Deneen as possible that was what they told her now on cross-examination it was pointed out by the prosecution okay so you told your sister yes but she's dead now isn't she uh yeah she's dead and you told your mom yeah she's dead now isn't she yeah so everybody that you told this story to they're dead they, so they can't back you up well, that's true. They're dead. Yeah, they're deceased. Yeah. Interesting. And I might point out that her mom passed away in April of 2002. I'm sorry, April of 2015. Which is shortly before Deneen goes to the police. And yeah, shortly before Deneen ends up going to the police. So I'm kind of curious as to whether you know Beverly played a role in her mom's death you know could maybe mom did figure out what happened and I don't know I'm just saying she died the same year that Deneen went to the police and this whole thing started escalating just saying so she she sends the girls to school that day and she the testimony from Cicely is that there was a padlock when she came home from school on the basement door. This woman, Beverly, says, no, I never saw a padlock. No one padlocked the basement door. 
She doesn't know why Cicely testified to that. There was no padlock. So she was also asked, did, you know, one of the reasons you, you were accused of this murder is because you, you said Robert was molesting the children. She goes, no, Robert was not molesting the children. So she talks to her mom. She's still not gone to the police. I don't know if they told her to go to the police, but she didn't go to the police. So within six weeks, and she said it was all prompted by this person that came to the house. She said some man showed up at their house who was a friend of Robert's. And she was not allowed to testify about what he came to the house for. So I have a feeling they were looking for Robert for some reason. And she didn't want anything to do with it. So six weeks after Robert's death, they're gone. She's gone to Jamaica. Deneen has gone to Texas to live with her girlfriend. Now, she, she really did not want to admit to that. She said, no, Deneen was driving. She was driving a car around to different states. And at one point she said it was some kind of drug car that Robert had arranged. That never, nobody ever went into that. So I don't know what to make of what she was saying about that, but whatever. So she goes to Jamaica and she ends up marrying this Rainy guy, Rainy. And apparently Rainy is somebody that she had had a 20 year relationship with. And they decided he was from Jamaica and they decided to get married. So my now my curiosity is like, is this the guy she's having an is she having an affair with him while Robert's in prison? And now Robert gets out of prison in 2002 and she's got to get rid of Robert. Because it was three and a half months after Robert gets out of prison. He's living in the family home that he gets murdered. And she was asked, you know, did you have anything to gain by killing Robert? And she said, no. So they didn't mention any life insurance, nothing like that. Except if she's got this boyfriend in the back seat, this Jamaican guy. So she moves to Jamaica. Now she is, she has Dedeen come to Jamaica to be her maid of honor. The person she was told to get as far away from as possible. She has her come over, stay for a month and be her maid of honor interesting so then her mother she stays for six years in jamaica she comes back to texas when her mother who's then 80 says can you come stay with me and help me out so she says okay so so tasha flies she flies tasha directly from jamaica to texas to stay with mom but meanwhile she and her the baby that she now has, the little boy, and her son. Um, okay, no, it's Sicily. Sicily is the one that flew to Texas directly. So she and Tasha and the and the baby, they go through five other countries and cross the border of Mexico to get into Texas. And he's like, why don't you just take a direct flight? And she goes, well, any time that I have the opportunity to go through other countries, I do it for the experience. And I'm thinking, why? You're sitting in an airport. You can, If I'm sitting in an airport in Atlanta, it's, it's not really any different than sitting in an airport in Puerto Rico or France. Or, I mean, you're in an airport. You're not sulking up the culture. I, I wouldn't think. I don't know. I haven't been, the only foreign country airport I've ever been to that I can remember is um, the Philippines. And that was scary as hell. That was an experience, scary as hell experience, but not till I got outside of the airport, actually into the streets, you know, waiting for someone to pick me up. So I don't, I don't know what the heck she was talking about, but I think she was evading being identified you know, in case somebody's looking for her. Yeah. And it did come out that she does have a criminal past. She had been uh, caught several times in Texas for theft and uh, passing counterfeit something or other and fraud. I don't know, counterfeit checks or money. I have no idea. Um, 
So I don't know how those turned out, but it, it, it had to be come out so the jury would know that she had some crimes of dishonesty in the past. So one thing I noticed when I went back and listened to her direct testimony again, after listening to the cross-examination, where she's very adamant that she had told her mom and her sister, her older sister, about what happened. I listened to the direct, and her attorney said very clearly, when Cicely came to you to ask about what happened to her father, was this the first time you had ever told another human being about what happened? Yes. What? And then... Later on, you're going to tell us you told your mom and your sister who dad and can't back you up? Well, now we know she's lying. I mean, it, that question was clear as day. To another human being. Yes, that was the first time. And that wasn't until 2016 or 20, 2014. 2014. Yeah. She's telling the prosecutor on cross-examination that she told her mom and her sister the day after the murder. So then they talk about her leaving Texas. Now, Cicely's testimony was that her mom just all of a sudden puts the house on sale for cash, sells everything, all the contents, and, you know, like has this fire sale and moves, leaves the state of Texas to go to Pakistan and marry this guy. But this move also came close in time, proximity, 2015, to when, uh, to when Deneen goes to the police. So she was asked by the prosecutor, weren't you and Deneen having arguments over mom's money? After she goes, mom didn't have any money. And Deneen got tired of arguing with you, so she told you she was going to the police and, and telling them what happened. So you fled? No, that's not how, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Mm -mm. Okay. I'm sorry, this woman that's guilty of sin, she's going down. She's going down. So, um, like I said, we're only getting snippets from Court TV. Uh, once I hear that, you know, obviously this is the defense. Once I hear that the verdict has been returned by the jury, I will let you know how it turns out. And I will... Um, as far as the Chad Daybell trial, that did start today, jury selection. They're televising or showing on YouTube jury selection, which other than watching paint dry, this is probably one of the most boring things ever. Jury selection, Wadir, is so boring. So no, I'm not covering that. I'm not recapping that. There's a there's a there's a line in the sand that I have to draw on recaps. No jury selection. But Yes, I will be covering the trial of Chad Daybell. So tomorrow, I uh, there's no court today in the Border Patrol case, but I'm going to recap what happened on Friday in that case in tomorrow's episode. So have a wonderful Monday, everybody. Monday, Monday. Do y'all want to see that painting all the way? Look. Oh, isn't it cool? So cool. I started a new one. Just have to get, got, get that in. Here's this is the one I'm starting here. It's called the Afghan Cat. So cool, so colorful. Anyway, have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye.